Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another edition of the Spurs Chat Podcast. In this edition, I'm joined by an absolute legend, actor and Spurs fan, Rudolf Walker. Um, an absolute legend in the acting world, best known for playing Bill Reynolds in Love Thy Neighbour, Constable Frank Gladstone in The Thin Blue Line, and of course, uh, Patrick Truman in Senders. Rudolf Walker, CBE. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here. Rudolf, welcome to the channel. How are you? Oh, I am all right. I, I'm a bit nervous, I must admit, because um, this is the first time here I am at the ripe old age of 84 doing a podcast. Wow. Yeah. Um, yep. So uh, how I was persuaded to do a podcast that I don't know, I don't know. But here I am. I, I At this point in time, I have no regrets, especially as we are talking to the Tottenham Hotspur supporters. Fantastic. Well, Rudolph, that's exactly why you're here. Of course, this is a Spurs podcast. I have many fantastic guests on. Um, absolutely delighted to have you here, as I say. One thing that really surprised me is that I learned that you are a Spurs fan. Um, normally, you know all the famous fans. I've <laughs> never heard that you're a Spurs fan. And uh, I put out on social media in the last week or so that you'd be coming on the channel. And everyone is really surprised saying, he's a Spurs fan. Really? How did it come about? What 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 got you into Tottenham? Well, it's extraordinary because I, I came over here in 1960. Uh, that's a long, long time ago. And it so happened that I lived not far from the ground. I lived in Tottenham, uh, Islington, all that area was my, um, you know, my patch. And of course, Tottenham in those days was the sort of the unbeatable team. You know, I mean, uh, you know, the likes of uh, Harry, uh, Blanche Flower and McKay and, and, and Jones and, and these guys. And I just gravitated towards the club. And that's how it all started. Um, so I didn't want to hear anything about any other club. It was Tottenham in, in those days. And, and well, well, I, you know, I remain, you know, I must admit that I don't attend as many matches as I would like, um, you know, schedules and various things. But no, I am, um, funny enough, people thought back in the Love Thy Neighbor days uh, that I was a West Ham supporter simply because that the character supported West Ham. But you yeah. see, I didn't have to say. Otherwise, I would have said, put me on Tottenham. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love it. Um, I, I was about to call you Patrick then. I, I'm, I'm so sorry. The amount of times I'm going to probably call you Patrick during this podcast. So I do apologise for that now. Rudolph, um, what was your first game? What do you remember about it? Oh, gosh. No, 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 no. Come on. Come on. What are you trying to do to me? Give me a <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. I, I'm very jealous because you've seen a lot more trophies than I have. <laughs> not as a footballer, definitely not. I'm sure you've seen <laughs> trophies as a footballer. No, my trophies are in the sort of the acting in, in, the, in the acting world. I'm, I'm trying to remember now because it would have been about 19, 1961, and I'm not sure it wasn't a team that is in the Premier League. It might have been something like like Leeds or something like that going back those many years. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would have been, you know, way back then. Um, yeah. Uh, so forgive me, supporters, that I can't pinpoint a particular team that I saw then. Well, you, say, you definitely saw you definitely saw them in the in the best season in our history because, of course, 61, but, but, we won the double. Yeah. Hang on. Come on. Come on. Yes, I saw them in the best. This is not to say um, they're not fantastic now. Please. <laughs> well, yes. hope, hope, hopefully the good times are coming well yes I mean I, I, I have every confidence in, in, in the way they're playing now I have confidence in the manager um, I haven't seen any of the games this season but I'm looking forward to, to, to visiting the ground in fact I haven't been to the new Arb stadium yet um, and that is going to happen sooner rather than later I'll tell you what, Rudolph, after this, I'll definitely uh, get you some sort of invitation, I'm sure, uh, to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. It'll be absolutely a pleasure. Um, now, let's. Um, you mentioned earlier you're now 84. On your 60th birthday, uh, Michael Aspel presented you with that red book, that famous red book. And I think that that show should return uh, to the TV. This is your life. 
Uh, you were at Lord Cricket Ground at the time. And then on your 70th birthday, you launched the Rudolf Walker Foundation, which aims to provide uh, opportunity, opportunities and incentives for disadvantaged um, youths um, starting out in entertainment. Tell us more about that and how you got into that. Yes, well, first of all, it's not youth wanting to go into the entertainment. No, that's not the... I'm using drama as a means of getting them, inspiring them, getting them to be self-confident. Um, uh, it started, in fact, it started back in 70, 72, when um, Love Thy Neighbor, the series that I, I, I did uh, with the black couple living next door to the white couple for the young ones who don't know anything about it. Um, and uh, visiting schools in Brixton and, and Bristol and Birmingham, um, I was amazed that the youngsters were saying, look, Rudolph, we have problems. Um, we call it lining in Trinidad, when youngsters get together at a corner or after school and just talk and just laugh and have fun. Not disruptive. And, you know, in those days, they were stopped by the police. And when I questioned them, they said, well, what do we do? You know, um, and it was out of that that I decided, you know what, let me create a drama competition between, there were two schools in those days that I, I worked with, the Dick Shepherd and the, uh, the Tulsa School in Brixton. And um, the idea was that they go away in groups again, outside school hours and write and direct their own 10 or 15 minute piece. But what it meant that they had to communicate with each other. They had to mm -hmm. support each other. Um, you know, they, they had to be creative. And the, the idea was that at the end of, uh, let's say, uh, a month, uh, the school would select the best two or three groups to go forward and perform on a Sunday in front of celebrities. You know, we had Cleo Lane, we had the late Little and Large, quite a lot of celebrities supported uh, yeah. that in those days. And on a Sunday, and it was just fantastic to see, get the reaction from these youngsters um, and out of that, you know, kids, I get stories with youngsters. It, it gave them that confidence that they needed. Not many of them went on to do drama because that wasn't the, the aim of, of it in those days. Um, sadly, the school's closed. It's now a housing estate. And a few years ago, back just before my 70th birthday, I was approached by um, a, a youngster in Tottenham. Um, Mervyn Cato, who works for the Enfield Council, and he said to me, look, we have problems, of course, in Enfield and in London and other places. Uh, what can we do? And it was out of that that I decided to relaunch the, um, the, 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 the inter-school drama competition and also form the um, Rudolph Walker Foundation. And it's not just um, have doing drama in school. We 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 have a role model award where the you know the between the teachers and the students they select someone who um, was a is, is a role model during that year and we present them with a with a trophy and we have other arms of the foundation like bridging the gap where youngsters either have a conversation with a, a senior citizen it could be their grandmother their aunt or a neighbor down the road and go away, have interview them for as long as it takes and go away and write a story on that individual. Yeah. And, and yes, so that is the process we go through. So there are lots of things that the foundation is doing at the moment. Rudolph, we'll, we'll come on to talk. We'll, yeah. we'll come on to talk about your story shortly. Um, but would you say, <laughs> would you say it's easier would you say it's easier to get into acting now than it was when, when you started out? It's very difficult to know how to, to compare. Um, it was difficult then, and I mean, I extremely difficult um, because at times, if you think of it, um, in my day, it was um, you only got parts that were specifically written for a black actor. So it had to be mentioned in the script somewhere, the black doctor, the black road sweeper. Uh, and those, you know, they were just few and far between, um, mm -hmm. you know. So when we go for an interview, you know, we had, um, I turned up for an interview back in the 60s and the, through into the 70s. You know, I was up against 
people who were dancers and who were musicians and who, you know, uh, and there I am as an actor competing with them for one part in, in a television play. Um, uh, yes, I mean, it was tough then. And I, my gut feeling is, is equally as tough now, if not more so. Yeah. Well, I don't know about whether you're a dancer. I certainly know you're a singer. We will come on to that shortly. Um, uh, hang on. <laughs> 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 Rudolph, let's go back to let's go back to talking about Spurs because, as you mentioned, you come over to the UK in uh, 1960 from Trinidad. Uh, of course, Spurs won the double in '61. We won the FA Cup in '62 uh, and '67. Right. European Cup winners' cup in '63. Various trophies in the '70s, '80s, '90s. We haven't won a trophy since 2008 at Tottenham Hotspur. What have you made? of the last 15 years or so. We've gone through so many managers. We've seen the likes of Harry Kane and so many good players leave our football club. What, what have you made of it? And when do you see a trophy coming along again? Well, it's depressing, um, you know, as a, and I find, it, <laughs> I find it a bit demoralising because a lot of my colleagues in, 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 at work, they either support Arsenal, which is a, a, a bad word for me. And so I get ribbing in, yeah. in the dress. In the, on, on the, in the green room, they support Man United. My son is a Liverpool supporter. I mean, how bad can you get? You know, how did you I, allow that? I, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, once again, he's in his um, early fifties, so there must have been something that happened along the way. Um, you know, maybe he said, "You know, hang on, um, Dad's team isn't doing anything. Why should I tag along and be um, for follow him?" But no, it's, it's been painful, you know, near and yet so far. And one of the things that I notice over the years that they get, Spurs get into a fantastic run. You know, they have key players. And at, at a point in time when they're doing well, one or two of the key players are injured. Yeah. And that seemed to be the pattern. And we have the same pattern again, again really, um, you know, within the last um, few weeks. Um, yeah. Two or three of key players just at a time when we had gathered momentum and you, and you can see the quality of football and I hope it is not history repeating itself I, I hope that but in fact what I still see in spite of the fact that those players are not there they are still playing a quality of football that I enjoy watching albeit on the television when I get a chance um, so you know there is hope that when they do come back that the momentum will pick up again yeah, you know, yeah. And, and as I said, it has happened throughout, you know, for many years. This seem, has seemed to be the problem. The problem, again, unlike other teams, we don't seem to have that that depth. You know, you yeah. can look at the Man Cities and the Man United and the Liverpool. They have a second team that they can call and just equally as powerful and as good as, as the first team. You mentioned there about your colleagues. Um, do you talk about football a lot, um, particularly at, say, EastEnders? At the moment, I try and avoid it as much as possible. Well, yes, I, in the past few years, <laughs> I, but if you, I don't think you know what it's like to be surrounded by guys who support Arsenal and other teams that are doing well. Yeah. It, it, you don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, know, you know, you don't have an answer. Um, but the, the, sometimes you wonder, um, yes, it's great to get trophies and it's fantastic. Um, but it is also, for me, it is also fantastic to see a, a team playing with the fluidity, with, with, with the, you know, the, um, it's like a ballet. You know, the interchanges and, and, and the, the, the ball players. Are, it, it's, it's, and to see them going forward rather than be on the back foot all the time. It, it's it's something to a sight to behold. And that has been, you know, back in the 60s and the 70s and whatnot. That's something about Spurs that I, I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy. Not the defensive um, attitude that has been adopted for a number of years. Yeah. As I say, Rudolph, I think you were spoiled in the 60s with the amount of trophies and the, and the playing style that we had then. Incredible. Oh, yeah. 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 Gilles um, in yeah, yeah. Rudolph, in an interview you did last year, 
Um, someone asked you about retirement and you said retiring. What is that? No, I enjoy it. I enjoy being there. I enjoy working. You also said the buzz is always there. I want to enjoy it and I want a challenge. I still get butterflies. And you mentioned that to me before we went um, on air uh, this morning. You said, I still get butterflies and I still get nervous. And you said you even got nervous about coming on this podcast. Um, yeah. Can you can you tell me, is that still the case about the retiring thing? Um, will you ever retire? No, I, I can't see myself re retiring at all. There, there is, I still feel for me, Rudolf Walker, there is so much more work to do. Um, I I look forward to going to the studio. I, I I really do. It is not a chore for me. Some mornings, you know, there are many mornings that I I they pick me up at six o'clock. I mean, I have the uh, luxury now or the advantage of not driving to the studio, which takes about an hour and a quarter. After a certain age, they, yeah. they give you a car. Um, but the 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 idea of going into the studio. And just having, first of all, having to prepare your lines, prepare your, your work, because you, you've got to enter the studio knowing your lines. Um, that in itself is, an, is a challenge. And, I, you know, I spend hours. I'm not the, the quickest learner of lines. I mean, there are people who, they look at a script. Um, you know, the late June Brown, who played Dot, she was just amazing. She can look at two or three pages, read it to you know two or three times and she knows the thing that is a and it's a quality that i never had i have to work and work and work at it and i arrive in the studio and i you know people talk about or talk about having uh adrenaline or what's the phrase they use um a high yeah and that oh that's what i experience i just it, it's it, it i still have that kind of childlike approach I, I just want to get on set and work and experiment and uh, and interact with uh, other actors um so and yes I, I i still um get nervous i don't take things for granted i don't think because i have been in the business so many years it will come just like that i i also look forward to directors you know we get new directors who challenge me and say, well, Rudy, try this and try that. On although you know, I've been doing it for so long. Um, so yes, I, 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 it's. So what am I going to retire for? You know, and I also involved with so many. But not only the, um, you know, my own foundation. I am also patron of a hospice, the Havens Hospice in um, in South End on Sea. Uh, you know, prostate cancer, um, things like that, um, diabetes. You have so many things that I am involved in that keeps me active and, and enjoy. And, and, and I, enjoy. I love that. Um, so what, what is the key to, to learning lines and, and how would you advise inspiring actors to, to go about learning their lines and remembering them? What, what, what is the key to it? Look, if I can find the actual key for it, I'll make a fortune. I don't have a, I don't, I don't want actors to go through the, you know, the, 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 the what should I say, the, the sleepless nights of, uh, or the, yeah, the, 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 it's, it's a different, you know, it affects people different ways. I have yeah. to slog it, I have to go over it. I find it a lot easier in the theatre because I have, you know, there is a, rehearsal period you know be it three weeks or something like you don't have that luxury on eastenders and especially if you and you have a heavy storyline and i admire the actors who who are doing it you know heavy storyline and they arrive on set they know their lines um I, I, you know i admire actors like that and remaining in character i, I to me, and maybe this is why I survived so long. You know, it doesn't come easy. Yeah. Well, you have to work hard in life, don't you? Um, Rudolph, back to football. Um, whether it be a Spurs player or just general players that have played for other clubs, who have you enjoyed watching over the years? Who 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 uh, who really catches your eye and you really enjoy watching them on TV or, or live in person? Best. Oh yes, 
I think he was probably one of the best, one of the, the finest footballers that um, that's come out of the uh, uh, out of the Premier League or out of England. Um, George Best, uh, you know, he was a a ball player. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, in those days, you you start thinking of him as you know, I I have this great admiration for Brazilian players. You know, like the ball stuck to their feet and um and the the way they dribble and, and and to me in those days george best epitomized the the, the sort of the, the type of football i i i i like um you know there, there you know there's been a lot of great players coming out of the uh, out of the uk let me i think you're having problems seeing my the sun which is a uh, hang on just a second that's gone Right, I think that's better. Um, yes. Uh, uh, yep, I mean, there are lots of um, brilliant um, players out of, out of the UK. But as I said, the one that stuck in my mind um, is, is George Best, without a doubt. I mean, um, you know, I, I don't want to take, um, you know, sort of party line or... or, or, or or T because he never played for um he never played for Tottenham. Yeah. It's a, it's about admiring great players though. I I tell you I was very lucky in the nineties. I, I went to an evening with George Best and the stories that he came out with, truly entertaining. He spoke a lot about um Miss Welds and 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 women and and that kind of thing and you know the drinking and you know the the entertainment uh side of things of football but it was a, a very entertaining night and I've seen many clips on George Best he looked a, an unbelievable footballer um Rudolf let's come on to talk about your acting career because you mentioned earlier in 1960 you were living in Trinidad you always dreamed of becoming an actor and you were encouraged to pursue your acting career abroad you were going to go to um, America but you were mm -hmm. persuaded by your friend to then come to the UK um how did that come about because you actually told your friends and family I'm going to be a star. And of course, you turned out to be a star. <laughs> well, no, I, in fact, I, I don't know about telling them that I'm going to be a star. I told them that I wanted to be, you know, I, I, Trinidad was too small, you know, and I, I would go to the movies and I see all these great actors. And, and in primary school, I, I, I did a lot of acting. In primary school, I was the youngest in, in, in what they call, over here you call comprehensive school. Um, yeah. it, call it elementary school back in those days. So there I am as a 10 year old, um, being the youngest in a group of all the older actors um, and performing uh, and suddenly being given leading roles at, at the age of 12 and 13 above the more senior actors in, in school. So the, 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 the seeds were sown very, very early on in my career. It's so much so that at the age of 14, I had my own drama group outside of school, you know, where I got a lot of my, my friends in the, in, the, in the area. And we did poems, we did little plays that we wrote ourselves and um, took it to other schools and performed on a Sunday afternoon. Um, so there I was doing those things at the age of 14 and, and, and 15 and then joined one of the leading um, uh, amateur dramatic group in, in, the, in Trinidad called the Company of Players. And I, once again, I was the youngest member in, in, that, um, in that company. So it, it was a, uh, the obvious thing for me, it, uh, wanting to be an actor, I, I couldn't remain in Trinidad. And yes, you're quite right. A friend uh, wasn't my friend then, but he was a leading actor, Trinidadian actor, the late Errol John, who was doing fantastically well in those days, working out of Hollywood, had his a place in, 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 um, in, in, in the UK. He wrote a fantastic play called Moon on the Rainbow Shrawl, um, which he won an award for. But nonetheless, he came to Trinidad and I asked him what's the best thing to do. And he said, well, pack your bag and go to England is the best place rather than America. And that's how I ended up in, um, in the UK. And I must admit, it wasn't something that my mother, uh, my mother endorsed. I was a single parent family and my, 
Um, you know, I had a job in a, what we call a government printing office as a, as a compositor. And it was, a, you know, it was a, a job if I want for life, you know, being a civil servant. Um, but I, I didn't have a good reputation with the, with the boss at the government printing office simply because of many evenings when I should go to classes, because that was compulsory to do the city and guild exams. I, I would be with a drama group. Yeah. And uh, then I would be whole before the government printer and I would apologize. And I would, because that was part of the contract. And I would attend for about uh, a month or so. And then off I go again, an excuse to go and rehearse with another company. Um, but, you know, here we are. And I eventually, my mother said, well, okay, um, I'll give you my blessing. And I set sail in August 1960. Rudolph, it wasn't until 1965 when you got your first speaking role uh, in the Wednesday play, playing a, a police officer. How was that? Oh, uh, that was quite something because um, it, it was directed by uh, a BBC director called Christopher, the late Christopher Morahan. Well, he was about six foot ten or something like that. I remember going to the office to meet him, and you know, I was warned, Christopher. You know, he is what we call Mister BBC, and he was a tough cookie. And I walked into the, uh, you know, I hadn't done anything at all. You know, and I knocked on the door, walked into this office, and this guy got up from behind his desk. And I thought, my God. And so that in itself was, um, you know, made you want to shiver. And, you know, he shook my hand and these great big hands stretched out and oh, have a seat. And I sat and we talked, <laughs> you know. And then he said, um, yes, I'd like you to play the part. And this was a policeman. I, I, I never dashed out of a, 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 um, an interview as quickly as I did because I didn't want him to change his mind, <laughs> you know. And um, yes, and it was a remarkable experience, you know. And I was surrounded by um, actors, you know, who were fantastic. I mean, one of them who became, or two became my mentor, um, the late Earl Cameron, um, who died at the age of 103 or something like that. And um, Carmen Monroe, um, brilliant actress. Um, they were, both of them were my mentor. And uh, so that really was, that was my first experience on television, um, a speaking part in, in, in the UK. Rudolph, a couple of years ago, I was very lucky to meet a good friend of yours. So a little bit about Spurs. And he actually said to me that, Although he supports Spurs, he's also got quite a fondness for Arsenal. And back in the day, a lot of people used to uh, watch Tottenham one week. They had a season ticket at Tottenham. And then the, the, the following week, because Spurs were playing away, Arsenal were playing at home, they'd have a season ticket at Arsenal as well. Do you, do you remember, do you remember, um, do you remember any friends or, or anyone that you knew doing that? Because it, it, it seems a very strange thing. That would never happen nowadays, would it? No, I can't think of anyone who did anything like that. Certainly not within the acting fraternity that I uh, that I was mixing with at the time. No, um, you know, you're a Tottenham Hotspur supporter or not at all. And you, what you're going to well say, <laughs> you know, unless Tottenham, <laughs> unless Tottenham was playing at Arsenal, that's the only way you'll go there. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, I, I, I remember. Um, uh, a, a few years ago, when Reading um, was when they were in the Premier League, uh, Division One, and because I lived in the area, and my daughter then was um, uh, working for the local papers and had quite a uh, an input um, with, with Reading, that I I went to a few matches uh, at, at Reading, and there I am sitting in in the director's box or the VIP stand and Spurs playing, and I had to keep quiet. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm, you know, I'm in Reading territory. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, so back to the question, no, I I never did. And um, unless Spurs are playing at um, Arsenal, um, I, I'm not going to get a ticket for Arsenal, sorry. 
<laughs> but of know, course. to give jackets jacket they are playing some they, they where they are yes they're well deserved but you know what i was very impressed with the game between spurs and arsenal and i you know for the arsenal uh supporters and footballers i'm sorry to say that spurs played a better game on that day and i you know even the games that we were beaten in the last you know two or three um games i i i i think we should we came out with our head held high yeah Rudolph, as I said at the start of the show, um, many of us didn't know you were a Spurs fan. Are there any other secret Spurs fans out there in the acting world? Um, not that I know of. I think the ones who are Spurs supporters would probably be out in the open and would have been yeah. shouted <laughs> over the years. I, I, no, I don't know why I've never been asked um, publicly, um, you know, the team that I support. So... This is an opportunity, my first opportunity to, to tell the world that I, um, you know, I have been a Spurs supporter since the 60s. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to have you here and, and to talk about it. Um, let's talk now about Love Thy Neighbour, um, which, of course, ran from 1972 to 1976. You were one of the main stars in the show that ran for seven seasons. Um, this show, it's fair to say, made you a household name. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it was a, a, ra a race relations British humour. I don't think you would get away with putting this sort of humour on TV nowadays. Certainly not. Um, no. Talk to me about Love Thy Neighbour, because you also mentioned in, in previous interviews that you've done over the years that um, you were in On The Buses in the first episode of On The Buses, but they, they decided to continue with without you on that show. Can you can you tell me the reasons why? Well, the, the reasons why, I mean, it's some pretty bizarre in this day and age, or will it? Um, I was pulled aside uh, because I worked the same guy who directed um, On The Buses um, or had an input in On The Buses also, um, uh, directed me in Love Thy Neighbor. And he said that, look, the powers that be, i.e. the writers, uh, the, the producers and the, the, the station, felt that it, would, um, it wouldn't it would help the ratings having a black actor as a running character. And those were his words. Um, uh, which, uh, if you know the... the, the, the this, yeah, and, and, you know, I was astounded. Um, but it didn't come as a surprise. You know, if you think of this sort of racism that was, you know, that was apparent in those days, um, you know, I arrive at the time when they, you know, you had to face that thing of going and looking for digs and it's no dogs, no blacks, no Irish. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, one had to endure um, periods like that. So when, you know, when he told me that, um, you know, I, I it, as I said, it didn't come as a surprise, um, but it made me as an individual more determined to succeed. Um, uh, you know, nothing like that would, um, would deter me from fulfilling my dreams and the dream being to be, not necessarily to be a star because that never entered my vocabulary, just to be an actor who working all the time, who would be called upon, who playing different roles, the challenges. That really was my aim and had been my aim for God knows how many. The fact that people are talking of, um, you know, yes, you're a household name and you're a star. Um, okay, all right. But um, it, it, but that never was my um, thing. It's just to be a good actor and to, you know, harness my craft and to get better and better. <clears throat> Love thy neighbor when it came along. <clears throat> uh, I went along for the part as um, did many of my uh, black actors at the time. And um, yes, I got it, but what was something that I, I don't think the general public realized or uh, aware of is that in conversation with the writers and the director, I made it absolutely abundantly clear that my character is not going to be an Uncle Tom, i.e. is not going to be no sir, yes sir, no sir, 
It's a case of if you hit me, I'll punch you back. If you call me a name, I'll call you back. And, and that was the premise of the whole thing. So in other words, we were supposed to be on, on, on equal terms. Yeah. You know, I, and in fact, it's the woman who, um, you know, who tried to bring some semblance of normality into it. Because, you know, we have to realize that if, and that was my take in those days, if it took a, um, a series like Love That to solve, if we say Love That it was introduced to solve the problem, then really and truly we, we, we wouldn't have a problem. We don't have a problem. It was done purely for entertainment. And it was of that period, of that era. And you're quite right. It, it can't happen now. And so lots of things that can happen because society has shifted, society have changed. I wouldn't do a love thy neighbor today. Yeah. Um, sometimes I question, is it, have we gone so far the other way that we are now, we have lost our sense of humor in that, i.e. that you can't, you've got to be careful, so careful what, you say, you know, if it's just saying something about somebody with a blonde hair or, or whatever, you know, and I, uh, uh, as a public person, I have to be so careful. Yeah. What could easily be a very innocent statement can be interpreted, not the way I intended. And yeah. that, is, that's sometimes that is a pressure that you know, I could do without. And I remember, uh, up and not too long ago, I frequented the um, Spitterfield Market. Uh, that's where all, you know, you get all your provisions and you, you get your, yeah, you, you get fruits and you get bunches of flowers and things like that. And that was an, a haunt for me on, on mornings, you know. Uh, uh, so I get up because I'm an early riser and I would, drive over to the market for half past four or five in the morning. And there were a group of men there. They're from all walks of life. You know, you know, you name it, Pakistani, in Cockney, oh, I mean, all over. And there are, in particular, there are about eight or 10 of us. And it was a joy to get amongst them because calling people, calling others names was nothing at all. It was done with a tremendous amount of humor, we took the Mickey or the Peacock out of each other. And look at him, look, look how you're walking. And, and I enjoy that environment. Now, if you had put a camera or a mic on any of us or any of those guys, the repercussions would be horrendous. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, come from a society in Trinidad where we take the mickey out of each other. I mean, that is what Calypsonians do, you know, regardless of who you are, whether you're a, a politician or whatever, that is the, 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 the nature of the society back in Trinidad. And it, it's no one takes offense. Women sing horrible things about men. Men do the same thing about women or what appear to be, you know, but it's all done with a tremendous amount of humor. And I think that this is as a world and as people, and, and I'm not using, I don't want to just use that, taking the Mickey out of, of, of each other as, a, um, a, 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 as a, the blueprint for how we should go forward, but just sense of humor, being able to laugh, being able to communicate with each other through humor. It is something that I feel is increasingly missing in the world and society, you know. Um, go ahead. Sorry. Rudolph, I was going to. I was going to ask. Um, what do you think of the comedy now? Because you go from a, a show like Love Line Neighbor in the seventies, and like you've said, you know, comedians now they have to be extremely careful what they say. Comedy shows have to be extremely careful what they do. You know, some of the recent shows, um, even something like Little Britain has now come off the screens. It's not, not allowed to be shown anymore. What do you make of the comedy nowadays? You know, I, I'm probably the last person to ask about comedy or what's that because I, 
I seldom, I don't watch much television. And the reason being is that I find my life now is so busy. In fact, I'm far busier now in later life than I was back in the, the 80s. And that's, and that's a fact. Um, yeah. So when I sit in front of a television, in fact, my, my, my children and grandchildren, they have a phrase, if you want to get that to sleep, put them in front of a television. Uh, and they have pictures of me uh, and visions of me standing in a room television is on and I'm sleeping and, 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 and that is unfortunate that I am a doer I I you would rather see me out in the garden um, doing something in the garden or building something I, I love DIY um, doing these things rather than watch television now having said that and even the news now I find so depressing so that I even that I, I don't want but having said that, there is a, 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 a series I, I watch sometimes, and it's not British television, and it's American television, it's very old called Fraser. Yeah. And I, I, I watch it and I kill myself with laughter because these uh, people are sort of everyday, there is no swearing, there is no, it, it's, and they find themselves in an awkward situation, and, uh, and I just love it. And there's, sort of an equal billing and there's an e equality between, you know, the male and female, you know, no one outdo the other. And that, that makes me laugh. So sometimes when I'm having a cup of coffee early in the morning, because it's on in the morning, I will watch it. And I would laugh for about half an hour and then I have to get on and, and get, you know, do other things. Bruno, what's your opinion on social media? I do very little of that. Sorry, you're asking the wrong word. I'm simply because that I, you know, there is a, I got to be very, very careful because here we are doing podcasts. And as, as I, I have to confess, this is the first time that I am doing it. I keep well away from this thing. I do as little as that as possible. There is a room for it. There is, yeah. I can see there is a need for it. I, uh, I'm going into a territory here that is, uh, in a, I, I know people are going to, you know, parents are going to come out and maybe hammer me here as a result of that. But there was, for instance, there was a very, an incident that I, I, I saw on a it might sound very trivial. I was on a bus a few weeks ago going from one part of Reading to the other. And uh, it was kind of crowded. And it is noticeable that everyone, you look around, and I, I do this sometimes, 99.9% .9 of the people sitting on that bus, young and old, were doing this. Yeah, And yeah. they were talking to each other, looking at each other, they were doing this. Mother, son, you know, husband, wife. Now that is something that worries me a lot. But in between that, a lady came on, mother, young mother came on in a pushchair with her little daughter. And I suppose the daughter would have been about four or about an age four. She came out of the pushchair and she stood up and that mother spoke to her all the way until just I just I got off the bus and I couldn't resist going up to her because and the conversation that this young star was I'm sitting there and I'm listening to part of it. The child asking mom, well, why this? What about that? And I, I couldn't resist the temptation of going to her and say, Mom, I admire you and your daughter. You're doing a fantastic job. Continue. Her phone, the mother's phone was in her back pocket. And I think, you know, to me, and uh, again, I can, I, uh, you know, at my age, the world has changed. It is not like, and things have moved on. It, it's, is it a criticism? Uh, maybe. It's just that it's a source of worry for me. It's yeah. a source of 
sorry because you know that the the, the, the lack of communication the the lack of you know the, that child that i saw her conversation at that age was fantastic and that didn't come out of that it came out of communicating with people that is what i did as a youngster growing up you know i i love to visit my old aunt and my my old uncles and just sit and talk to them but that yeah. that has gone out of the window so it, it's it's the 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 next generation the generations that come are we in danger of bringing into this world youngsters who lack communication i, I again i am quite prepared uh, even though that i am where i am today i listen and i'm quite happy to be to be told otherwise and to be convinced otherwise I've got to admit, Rudolph, I, I, I don't think social media is even good for footballers because sometimes when, uh, for instance, Spurs lose, there is a lot of uh, abuse on social media with the players, uh, about the manager, etc. Um, so, you know, sometimes I think that it needs to be, uh, you know, put to one side and, and used very little, you know, because it is taken over. Um, let's go back to talking about Spurs because... But he's out of the bag. Sorry? The, the genie is out of the bag. It's it's already yeah. out there. Yeah. The difficulty. Yeah. How do you reverse that? Yeah. Very true. Yeah. yeah. Um, Rudolph, what do you think would be a successful season for Tottenham this season? I know we've got injury problems at the moment, but of course we've changed our manager. Postacoglu's come in. Harry Kane, of course, left in the summer. Uh, January transfer window coming up. But what do you think would be a successful season? I know we all want to see Spurs lift a trophy, but uh, to perhaps get back into the Champions League, would you go along with that? I, I would go along with that. Um, you know, the, the, the to be in the, the top four. But isn't it amazing? And that is a measure of the, the manager that we have now. You know, a lot of people, maybe I, I wouldn't say including myself, thought that um, Kane goes and that's it, doom mm. and gloom. And what he's been able to do, and I, I you know, once I got to admire, he was able to use a, a nine, most of the players who were there for the last two or three years and mold them into a team that, you know, I wouldn't say up until because I still have hope, who would actually come just as good and at times better than the arsenals and the teams who are sitting there on level terms with them so yeah. i i don't want to get carried away and i try not to in life but yes being in the in, in that uh top four would be a, a, a an excellent season for Spurs, and i say excellent season but to be there or there about um, but continue playing the sort of quality football that they are playing yeah. at the moment. That is the most important thing. And I think that if they can avoid injuries and uh, bring in a one or two players maybe in the January window, um, you know, that is, is possible. Uh, and I, do think, I don't go... Hmm? Go ahead. Do you think Harry Kane will return to Spurs at, uh, at some point? I, I see no real, yes, I mean, one hopes so, but, you know, I, I, well, let's put it this way. If he comes back to the Premier League, I don't want him to go with, to any other club. Of course, <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> let, let him know, come back to Spurs. And, you know, I, I would like to think his heart is still with the Tottenham, uh, the Tottenham uh, club, you know, with yeah. Spurs. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, um, you know, it, it's I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it, and I can't wait. Given all the scheduling that I have to, you know, come and and, and sit in the stand and, and just enjoy the atmosphere. Absolutely, it's been it's been a great atmosphere. I know we've got injuries at the moment, but the mood has completely changed since the it's summer. Changed. It's been great. Um, Rudolph, I said uh, we we're going to talk about you being a um, a singer. You become a pop star in 1975. Uh, with a song called Reggae Woman. And, uh, of course, on the other side, it was it was Love, uh, produced by your good friend Eddie Grant. 
Talk to me about that. How on earth did that come about? Yes, exactly. How on earth did that come about? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I was approached by EMI just out of the blue by two guys from EMI saying, look, we have this um, number. We think that you could do fantastically well with it. And, I mean, it took me by surprise because I at no time at all did I ever advertise. I'm, I'm, I'm not a singer. I'm a... I'm a a, an actor, um, and, and if I do any singing at all, it's in the it's the bathroom. But you know what? Having said that, um, uh, back in the, the, the <laughs> not many people would know this. Back in the sixties, when I came here, as I said, I, I lived in Tottenham, and there was a a pub off the Essex Road, Southgate Road, Essex Road, and North Church Road, because I called the Jolly Farmers, and. On Saturday, on Friday and Saturday, you know, sometimes on a Sunday, when I sort of at a loose end, I would go in this pub. Now, I remember that I don't drink, you know. So if I go into a pub, it's orange juice. Yeah. So I went in the pub and I, I noticed, in fact, what drew me to the pub is that I'm passing there and I, I'm hearing singing. I heard singing, people singing, and there's a guy on a piano playing. So I thought, well, this is nice. Let me pop in and I saw them doing this. It was a black guy on the piano. And then they would ask people, you know, who want to get on the mic and sing. And invariably people who would go on the mic who can't sing and they're drunk. You know, but it was fun. You know, it wasn't, no one was criticized. They would, you know, your friend would say, ah, get off and things like that. But it was fun. And I went for the first week, the second week, the third week. And I thought, you know what? Let me go and ask. So I went and I, what would I sing? I sang one of the popular songs that I heard the DJ was the, you know, the, the resident singer, uh, something like pack up all my cares and woes. And he was singing this and the audience loved it. So I said, look, I, I wouldn't mind doing that tonight. So, I mean, he was over the moon. Yeah. So I took the mic and the people loved it. And I became a kind, whenever I'm popped in there, I became a, not only that, I would sing the old English songs. And that was that. That was the extent of my singing. You know, people yeah. were drunk, so they couldn't criticize. <laughs> you know, that was that. And um, they approached me, EMI said, look, we have this number. So I went to the, the office and I met them and we talked about it. And I said, yes. And then they said, well, look, we'll get um, Eddie Grant. So I thought, fantastic. So Eddie turned up and we rehearsed. And I must admit, I was petrified, absolutely <laughs> petrified in the studio. You know, they encouraged me, you know, they said, right. I said, well, can I, um, can I talk it? Anything to, to get out of actually singing. And you know, in those days you had all the guys, the top reggae singers and all. And I thought, no, nothing like that. So we made this record. <laughs> Um, and the horror was that a few weeks after they said, oh, you might have to appear on um, Top of the Pops. I said, what? It never happened. Because, <laughs> thank God. And so that is how that came about. And I would go to various venues and I wouldn't sing, but they would play it on the jukebox. And that was good enough for me. But I would sit in the, with a group of people and I would cringe. And I still do when it's played. Yeah. You know, when um, when did when did you last hear it? When I think it was played on my it must have been on my 80th birthday once again. Um you know I you know funny enough there is talk of um I know my daughter mentioned it some time ago um having it recut and use some other something I, I can't remember something she said about um doing probably doing with it but that's in their hands not in mine well, you, well nowadays you have to have a music video to go along with it so you need to record a music video <laughs> can we move on <laughs> <laughs> i thought the screen had frozen um rudolph let's go back to football um Jimmy Greaves was an unbelievable striker for Spurs. Um, oh, if yeah. we compared Jimmy Greaves or Harry Kane, for you, who was the better striker at Tottenham? Oh, I 
Jimmy Greaves, for me, he yeah, uh, that's a difficult one, you know. But I, uh, because I'm of that era, Jimmy Greaves, and he was by far, you know, if I I look at George Best, and if I have to go down the line or call anyone at all, Jimmy Greaves for me was just phenomenal, and he was a ball player, you know. Um, uh, Harry Kane has the, the record, you know, he was, he, Harry Kane is, is ruthless um, as far as scoring goals. Um, they were both great players. I, I, if it's a half percent, I might probably go to Jimmy Greaves. Yeah, um, I thought you might. Yeah, you know, there, there was something about him and his, his skills that was just phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Ball- it's funny. Uh- a lot, a lot of the older people I talk to, they they lean towards Jimmy Greaves, and uh, from what I've seen of Jimmy Greaves, looked an unbelievable player. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Rudolph, let's come on to talk about um, the Thin Blue Line uh, because, of course, you work with Rowan Atkinson, and uh, you might be surprised by this picture that I, I put up on screen now. This is you in the first episode of Mr. Bean, where, of course, you work with Rowan Atkinson. I, oh, I assume yeah. that that was just a, a one-off. A one day, one day's filming was it? What what was that like? And you know, at that time, you being an actor in that show, Mister Bean, that scene of him in the exam room. Um, yeah. What did you think? Did you think that that show would go on to be so successful as it did? No, no, no. no. And even doing when we started Love Thy Neighbor, at no stage did I think, and none of us thought um, it was going to go on to be a sex, a successful. A, successful as it, uh, as, as it, as it became and, um, right across the world. Um, and certainly Mr. Bean and in the, that particular episode, it's, you know, in the Caribbean, they, they talk about that particular episode and they, they still refer to, you know, me and, and Mr. Bean in that episode. No, it, it's it, under thin blue line. It's again, it's become a classic. Yeah. And because we only did, what 13 episodes um that's all it, it, it's just yeah. phenomenal it, it's um you know i consider myself blessed to have worked with um Ryan atkinson um you know the thin blue line it wasn't written for a black actor and in fact when we came to the last uh it was it ended up between a uh a, a shop- actor, a uh, white actor and myself for the, that particular role. And uh, of course, as it had it, I ended up playing it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so thumbs up to the, you know, Ben Elton and, and, and Ron Atkinson for giving me the opportunity to play that. Do, do you keep in touch with any of these actors from these shows? No, no, no. Nope, it, it's you go in and you do a job and do it to the best of your ability and you, you leave and go on to the other one. And there are very, very few over the years that I have um, kept in communication in communication with. Um, you know, there, there, there are one or two within EastEnders for obvious reasons. Um, but overall, no, you come in and you, you do what you have to do and, and, and you go out. I... I as you would have gathered, I I, uh, I lead a life away, well away from uh, show business as such. Although uh, my yeah. show business persona, whatever it is, um, uh, it's the reason why some people invite me to be back here and doing this. But it, it's still to me, I separate the two, and there is a life um, away from all that be it with the schools, be it with the hospice, be it with, you know, cancer, whatever. Yeah. Rudolph, we've spoken a lot about Spurs uh, winning trophies, but you've also won a couple yourself because you were you were given the, the Best Actor Award uh, from Time Out. In 2002, you were nominated for the Best Soap Newcomer uh, with the TV Quick Awards. In 2014, Best Actor. Um, Inside Soap Awards, 2015 Best Actor, British Soap Awards uh, nominations. And then in 2018, you were given the British Soap Award Outstanding Achievement Award. In your speech, you kept it very short and brief. You said, thank you, Father. If I can achieve this, so can you. 
Can I ask you who your biggest inspiration was growing up, wanting to be an actor, wanting to be a star, wanting to be in the best films, TV shows, theatres? Um, who was your inspiration? Who was the biggest inspiration in your career? Yeah, you know, that's a very difficult because none of my family, my mother, as I said, I came from a single parent uh, family and, and my mother um, was, wasn't in show business, although she loved um, reading poems with her friends. Um, no one uh, around me um, was in show. I, I was an odd one out. In fact, some of my friends said, you know, have stories of, um, uh, of me. I was, I, I mixed with them. I, I played all the naughty games and all the cricket and because they also, the teachers also had um, visions of me playing cricket for the for Trinidad and maybe going and play for the West Indies. I was an opening bat. I was a very good spin bowler. Um, and I ended up being captain of the, the, the school team. Um, so, uh, but I, there was no one at all, um, apart from going to the movies, you know, and seeing films, you know, with, with, with you know, call who, you know, of actors or people, the, the late Paul Robeson, um, when I was in Trinidad doing something called Saunders of the River, this American actor with a booming voice in the movies. Um, but there was no one near to me. And this, this, and this is strange, you know, normally you, there is someone or there is a family friend or something. No, it was just something that came into me as a youngster. And yes, as I, grew older, there were people I admired, so the late Sidney Poitier, um, who, you know, I worked with briefly, um, uh, and he was a, a source of inspiration. Um, you know, the fact that the late Errol John, the Trinidad actor, was doing so well in America and in the UK, and the Trinidad press would have articles about him and what he's doing. Um, I suppose that, in a way, um gave me inspiration or, or drove me forward but really and truly there isn't there isn't no no one at all it must be something that you know sometimes i say that old man up there whoever we want to call him said you know what um, i'm going to give you something i'm going to give you a platform i'm going to give you a gift um go out and use it um so, so that's how I, to that question, there is no one person. There are people, as I said, that I admire in, in, in life. Yeah. There are actors, there are mentors over when I came over here that I, I, I whose company I cherished and who um, I looked to them, look towards them for guidance at times. Um, uh, so that's as far uh, as I go as, as a sort of mentor of people who I, I, I look up to. Rudolph, as an actor for many years, what would you say your strengths are and your weaknesses? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you're a woman and you would ask me that question, I have a different answer. <laughs> 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 I, 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 my, my strength is that, that inner confidence, I suppose, without being the, the belief in myself, the belief in who I am, um, the, 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 the dignity, the pride I have in who I am and where I hail from, um, uh, that's my my strength. Um, my weaknesses. You now we are talking about weaknesses as as an actor or weakness as a person. Either or. Uh, um, I suppose my weaknesses as an actor is that I, although I I de hope I deliver my lines on the day, is the agony I go through in learning them. So. And I, I think I would have preferred to have the strength of someone who 
can look at a script two or three, four times and know the lines. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's my, my, my weakness. Um, I, I, I'd stick to that as my weakness because I, I think that if I elaborate on that, I might go into territories that um, I don't <laughs> think that I want to, that I would want to divert on board. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Rudolph, you mentioned you were a good cricketer. Um, did you ever play football? And if so, how good were you? Oh, terrible at football. I can talk the game. <laughs> <that I'm... laughs> no, I, but funny enough, I played for the school team. I, I played for the school team because I, I, I am not a, I was, first of all, I was never a long distance runner. I'm a sprinter, you know, so I, put me 10 yards and, and I go or something like that or 20 yards that I can beat most people in my around me. Um, but as a, as a long distance run, I don't want to run, 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 run. I just want to sprint and stop. Um, and having, so having said that I, the teacher put me in defense and I, I think it was my, it was my first game or second game I played. And the, there was a player who was a brilliant player and played cricket. He was an all sportsman, a guy called Fitzroy White. And he played alongside me. He was also defense, but he was very good in the forward line. And we were playing together. And we were playing against a school, one of our rivals. And I saw with my own eyes a player from the opposing team, rather than go for the ball, he went straight for his goalies. And, I, and he, my Fitzroy just doubled up. He recovered and continued playing. That was my last game. Wow. When, the, when, the, when Mr. Farrell asked me to, what about the, you know, put me on the team, I said, no, sir, I, I prefer to stick to cricket. But that was <laughs> an image that I, <laughs> that was an, I could defend myself with my bat. I could defend myself with my helmet that we start using now. There is no way I could defend myself with somebody who decided to kick me in my goodies. No, no, I don't so, blame you. <laughs> that was the last. But I admire, I love watching football. I love watching the Brazilians. You know, I, you know, I'm the sort of the Pele area, era. Um, you know, the Brazilian football. I, I, as I said, is it, ballet in, in motion, you know. So I love the game. I love watching the game. Um, uh, yeah, but playing football, no, and, and this is going to would contradict some of the things that I've just said. I was involved in a television series back in the late 60s. I was it in this in the eight, I'm trying to remember now, called United. It was a BBC series set up north, and I was a young footballer in the team, in the, this team called United. Obviously, it was based around Manchester United. Um, and uh, so on the odd occasion, I had to play football. And, you know, we, we, we had, um, you know, we had Jimmy, who oh, no longer with us, oh, well-known commentator and manager, Jimmy, 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 Jimmy Hill. And he came along and he coached us and we, and so I, but I, I held my own. I, you know, I, I don't think that I looked out of place um, playing that, but that was orchestrated. You know, it wasn't a, 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 a thing game. Um, the odd celebrity game back in, in, in the seventies at the peak of love thy neighbor, I would turn up and just kick a ball a few yards and, and avoid them passing the ball to me. Um, as I said, I, I could talk a game. I know sometimes you sit uh, as an armchair supporter and you say, why does he pass the ball back? Why does he pass the ball back? Just kick it forward. Look, there's a space there. All these sort of things I go through. So I know what's going on. But tell me to go out there and do it. No, 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 no. <laughs> Love it. Um, Rudolph, let's talk about um, you being awarded the CBE. Um, of course, in 2006, you were awarded the OBE and then only a couple of years ago, awarded the CBE for services to drama and charity. Let me put these uh, couple of pictures up here on screen. Uh, you were honoured by the award. You, you were honoured the award by King Charles, who, of course, was Prince of Wales at that time. 
Um, you said shortly after this happened that he made you feel extremely relaxed, but he spoke about Coronation Street and not EastEnders <laughs> and then apologised. Can you, can you talk us through that story? Well, you know, when I got there, it was, it was my daughter, Shona, next to me, which was, which was fantastic. You know, we got there and, yes, he started um, talking about um, Coronation Street. Um, and, you know, that split second, you start thinking, now, did he get the information passed on to him? Was it all wrong? So you, you, you for a split second, you kind of a, a, a panic and you think, how can I handle this? So I said, as usual, I said, your, your Royal Highness, um, let's not talk about Coronation Street. Yes, your mum visited the set there. She also visited EastEnders, you know, um, and uh, it would be a good idea. I mean, I'd, an open invitation. I would love you to visit the set at um, EastEnders. And he smiled. He said, you never know, maybe. Uh, um, and and, and that, that was that. Um, you know, I obviously talk briefly about the character and things like that. Um, and, and it was just to, uh, to me, then it turned out it might have been just a slip of the tongue rather than than he being um, coached and told that, look, this guy is from uh, Coronation Street. Um, it, it wasn't anything heavy. It was lighthearted. Um, but what was what was great and what was nice is that when he. I, I was surprised that he took that. In fact, I was told that, yes, they took up the offer and they were in communication. And um, I, I was out in, um, I, it's around the time that I was doing my go on holiday, you know, go to the Caribbean and go to Ghana. And um, I had a call from the BBC office saying, look, um, uh, they have taken up this, um, you know, Prince Charles then. Um, wanted we want to write a particular episode, and they are going to be part of it. And there's a special request because I was supposed to. I went to Ghana, and from there down to Trinidad for Carnival, only spending a day in London. And they said no. They would um, he, he would appreciate it if the office would appreciate it if I um, if I um, there when they pay the visit, and so the whole thing was changed around. So I. From Ghana, I stayed in back in the UK. There was a special episode written, and he even talked about it. Um, you know, on set, he said, um, "You know, look, um, you have to blame this man for me being here today." Um, which was, you know, so he he is with it. He he's aware of what was happening and what is happening, um, and it's not so. It's not I am there and you are here, and that's the end of that. Um, so he was in tune with what was happening, and uh, and it, it to me it was a fantastic experience. Rudolph, you you are the first person on this channel to have a CBE. What does that feel like? I, I, it must be such an honour to receive such an award and going to Buckingham Palace. Can you talk me through that experience? You you, you mentioned there you went with your daughter. She must have been so proud at, at, at that moment. Yes, I, I, I think so. Um, I mean, even when I got the OBE uh, at the palace and Princess Anne had given it, I think what was pleasing for me or what was um, fantastic for me is to watch their reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the way they're walking and looking around and looking at me and going up the stairs. Um, I, I, I think you don't... Certainly for me, I never sort of come into the business hoping to be honored for, you know, I come to do a job and I'm in a job that I enjoy doing. And yes, it gives pleasure to a lot of people. Um, uh, but I also, you know, for the charity work, I, I, I make sure I go out as much as possible because it, it's, it's, it's such a humbling experience. Rudolph, in all of the TV shows, films, and theatre shows that you've done, if I had yeah. to say one uh, one scene, if you had to think about one scene that you have done that was your favourite, and you always look back at your acting career and think that scene was incredible, that scene is the one that I am most proud of, what would it be? 
<laughs> um, oh, good scenes. I mean, if I go back, I, I did a, a television series called Black Silk, um, where I play the central character of the barrister. And there were some powerful scenes in, 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 in that um uh, in that series we did something like eight episodes and the, the, you know that there are uh, uh, moments that i uh, i that i thoroughly enjoyed um but more recent doing um an episode and scenes where patrick um got uh, he got a stroke albeit a mild yeah. stroke um that having you know, the build up to that and having to do the research and working on that, that um, was probably one of the, the, the best um, episodes and best, most challenging episode that I had to do, um, uh, you know, with uh, so far on television. Sorry about that. I sort of got carried away with, um, you, you know, the, 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 the question and, and, and having to supply the answer previously. Um, you know, as I, I as I was saying, it's a sort of humbling experience to, to visit the hospice and places like that, and to see the the joy in their faces, people's faces. Um, so that, to me, that's the reward. And and when I said, you know, when I received the the, the uh, thing, it's it's really a simple message to a lot of the youngsters, even youngsters who are listening to the podcast. Uh, you know to say that what I have achieved, um, that is open to each and every one of them. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean in the media, no, it doesn't necessarily mean being an actor. It could be any walk of life. It could be the top mechanic in a yeah. shop or the, 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 the top um, surgeon in the country, and that is happening. And so, so really that was my message when I received the award. If I can do it, you know, so can you and I, came from a poor background i came from a very humble background i know what it's like to be surrounded by violence i know what it's like to be to go hungry the, the or the, i know what it's like to to, to 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 sleep and and you're aware that there's a rat running just a few inches away from you i know what it's like to um you know i'm not sure whether mothers can afford a meal in the afternoon and a neighbor would um who you know would say oh come and and sit with the family. I, I know all that. I've been through all that. I didn't come from a privileged background. So it's a simple message to youngsters who feel hard done by, think the world is against them, society is against them. The ball is in your court. You can achieve things. You can achieve greatness. Rudolph, let's come on to talk about your career in EastEnders, because, of course, you joined Albert Square in 2001, 22 years ago. I don't know whether it feels like 22 years ago to you. I just want to read out um, some things here. In 2015, um, you filmed your 1000th episode on EastEnders. You are now one of the longest running characters uh, on the soap. You are known for your laugh, your trilby hat, the rum, the, uh, the <laughs> phrase, yeah, man. And, of course, you're a ladies' man. Uh, occupation in the soap. You've been a shopkeeper. You've been a B and B owner, a barman, a potman. The storylines include you having three wives, uh, being a possible father to Denise, the marriage to Yulandi, uh, an affair with Pat Butcher, uh, which I've got a, a picture here um, of that clip. <laughs> um, the death of your adopted son, Paul. Um, being assaulted, the Mitchell starting a vendetta against you, a relationship with Cora, uh, falling off a ladder. You mentioned earlier suffering two strokes, a relationship with Claudette, uh, marrying Cherie and discovering uh, you had a son, Isaac. There is a lot of storylines there. Does it feel like 22 years on EastEnders? That, that must have flown by. Oh, that has flown by. I mean, I, I when they, they, they um, called, you know, when they drew the cast together, to say I've now, you know, the, the thousandth episode. I mean, I must admit that came as a bit of a surprise. Um, no, I, I must admit that I don't ever think in terms, I don't feel 
you know, that I have been there as long as that. But yes, the reality is that I have been. Um, I, I think it's because that I, I, I enjoy it so much that time just just goes by. You know, it, it's um, yeah, it, it's. Yeah, but I, I think it's when sometimes when you see the the actors who came in as as babies and they're now you know Lacey yeah. Turner and and, and like that, you think. Wow, and she now a mother, yeah. And you think, well, hang on, I, you can, I when I first saw you a little baby, and you know you had chaperoned, and now you're a mother. So that is a sort of a, a reality check when that happens. Um, but no, it, it's um, you know I I I, I am blessed. Um, you know I I would like to think that I have worked hard to achieve that. You know, it's, um, uh, I, hopefully I had put in all the groundwork back in the, the 60s. Um, I, I could have ended up in, a, in America. So I've been encouraged back after, certainly after Love Thy Neighbor to, to go to America. It's not, you know, people said, you know, what are you doing here? I, I know that I made the right decision by not following the trend. Um, uh, to stay here and um, and uh, and battle and and and, and fight and, and and hopefully the world and the theatre is a better place. Rudolph, what would you say is the best line you've ever delivered? <laughs> Come on, you want me to go away from saying yeah, man? That is what you want me to say. <laughs> <laughs> Can I can I ask you, you, you you've done a lot of interviews over the years. Can I ask you very simply, what is the one question that you hope that someone will actually ask you in an interview but has never asked? What have you what what have you never spoken about that you actually want people to know about you? I think you have covered everything. I, I can't think of anything that um, my life, most of the time, is it an open is an open book. Apart from my very very private life, which I I tend to value and keep to myself. Um, but um, no, I I it's I can't think of a I th can't think of anything that I want the general public to know that. Uh, <laughs> don't tell me you have something like yeah, man. You have something lurking out there to ask me and you hope that I would say it rather than you ask me. You know, you are, the thing is that I, I do over the years, and it's a confession that I've, not a confession, I, back in the 70s and up until today, I, if you notice, I do very few interviews as compared to a lot of my colleagues. Um, yeah. um, in a way that is kind of deliberate because most of the time I want to talk about I wouldn't mind talking about my career as an actor. I talk about the charity work and things like that. Um, that is important. And I know back in the 70s in particular, um, the, every journalist, and I put a stop to that, wanted to know about my private life. What, um, you know, want to know about my wife then. Want to know about, you know, what I had for breakfast and things. That's yeah. not in the public that that's no, of nobody's concern and when i was in australia in fact um they, some of the journalists tried to take it a stage further and uh, there were two uh, old man saying there were two actresses in the company um very very attractive ladies and the day um the journalist uh approached them and wanted to know what is what is Rudy like off or offset. And in in other words, inferring that did I have an affair with them? So that is the extreme to which they wanted to get some information. So as a result, I I, I do. So you know doing this is yeah is is great and and um yeah one of the few. I was just gonna say you know, uh, Rudolph as well to the to the listeners and the viewers it's very obvious now that i did not give you any questions before you came on this podcast you didn't know what i was going to ask you today 
no, I, no. And I prefer it that way. Um, yeah. Um, I prefer it that way because it can be spontaneous. Um, and uh, you know, you just have to deal. Life is that you you deal with surprises. You deal with things that are thrown um, towards you, and that's how I I um, lead my you know lead my life. Um, you make mistakes. I make mistakes. We all make mistakes, and then you live to fight another day. Right. What's the most that, I, um? What what's the weirdest request that a fan has ever given you? What's the Say that again. The the weirdest request that a fan has rec uh, has given you. Oh, um, <laughs> you know, I, I I can't I I can't. I'm sure I've had weird requests from fans on, on EastEnders, but I can't. Uh, no, that's a question that maybe if you had. If you're prime me up, I'd have thought of something, but I honestly That's can't fine. think of anything. I can't think of anything at the moment, but, but maybe within the next minute or two, something will come back to me. Rudolph, very last question for you. Um, what is next for you? What is next for me? Um, to make sure, yeah. I mean, what is, is so important for me? I obviously will continue in, in, in EastEnders, you know, challenging storylines that are likely to come up. I'm sure there will be challenging storylines to come. Um, I, my doing the charity work that I continue to be able to do that. Um, but the, 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 the foundation uh, um, is very, very important uh, to me. And, um, you know, that hopefully or your your the, the listeners would get online and just um look at the rudolph walker foundation um uh, and see where the you know they, they they can help um support in any way at all possible it doesn't it doesn't have to be financial um um support it, it you know just when we are having events to you know to to to, to be there supporting the youngsters um there are lots of things that they, they can do um but that that to me is 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 my my dream my aim my 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 wish i want to extend it take it a lot further out than sent than london um extend it to although we have worked with youngsters in, in birmingham and cardiff and bristol we want to take it to manchester and other parts of the country and also my trip to Ghana and the Caribbean coming up soon is to um, to look at ways of linking um, further afield um, because the message is very simple. We need to support our young people. Uh, we need to give them the tools and one of the best tools that we can give them is self-confidence and knowing that there are lots of us out there who are there to support you. To, to a shoulder sometimes to cry on and uh, you know that that sort of self-confidence that is so vital and you the best way to do that is sometimes is through the arts and I'm, i i tend to get very uh, annoyed when the government and the powers that be tend to cut back drastically on the arts um, we need it in every walk of life Mm. You know, uh, and you know, the arts is so important. It's you know, being a musician or being a a painter, being a, a, a an actor. You know, it, it formed the basis of of our being. You know, to for a youngster to be able to to walk, go to for an interview and have the confidence to 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 talk to the the boss or the manager or the the, the foreman. It's priceless. And you do that at a yeah. very young age. Important. Rudolph, we will certainly put all of the details um, in the description box below on YouTube and, of course, on the podcast version as well. Um, Rudolph, you've been an absolutely fantastic guest. I, I just want to uh, make a deal with you. Um, I know this is the first podcast you've ever done. I wondered whether you'd come back when Tottenham Hotspur finally lift another trophy. Oh, yes, I want to be there on that day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
I could I honestly talk to you all day about acting, TV shows, films, football, whatever. You've been an absolutely fantastic guest. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, bless you. And, uh, you know, my old, the old saying is that it takes two hands to clap. And you have been a fantastic interviewer. So, you know, it, it, um, and thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you, Rudolph. And uh, thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for listening. And until the next time, come on, you Spurs. Come on, you Spurs.